Hello again, baseball fans, and welcome into the 21st episode of Ducks on the Pod. It's wild card time, and I'm here with a preview. Before we get into that, I do want to apologize. Wasn't able to come to you last week with the year-end show. Uh, basically, I got hit with the sickness to end all sicknesses. At least I hope so. I've never been sick like I was last week. You can probably still hear it in my nasally voice, but I'm here. I'm all good. It's wild card time, and without wasting any more time, let's get right into it. All right, coming at you first on Tuesday night. It's going to be the Minnesota Twins at the New York Yankees in that AL wild card. The history lesson here, the Yankees swept the Twins out of town just two weeks ago. That went 2-1, to 5-2, to 11-3 on Monday the 18th through Wednesday the 20th of September. Uh, before that, the Twins took two of three at home on July 17th through the 19th. That was just the second series out of the All-Star break. The marquee matchup in this one is going to be Irvin Santana versus Brett Gardner and Jacoby Ellsbury. Both those two guys have 11 hits against Santana in their careers. Gardner in 31 at-bats, Ellsbury in 34. These are not small sample sizes, so it's not just... Uh, that you're reading too much into a little bit of something. There really is something here to be looked at. I would fully expect these two guys to be in the lineup. And with Aaron Hicks returning to the lineup in such grand fashion last week after missing three and a half weeks with an oblique strain, that means Yankees manager Joe Girardi now has four outfielders with only three spots available. Now, I don't see how you could keep either Gardner or Ellsbury out of the lineup for this game, considering their good numbers against Santana. So somebody's going to have to be the DH, and actually it'll probably end up being Ellsbury. Uh, there's also the issue of the batting order. Now, Aaron Judge has been hitting second a lot lately. If not, then third. Uh, I wonder if Girardi might think about trying to get Santana early, trying to get to Santana early, excuse me, um, by putting the pressure on early in that first inning, putting Ellsbury and Gardner at the top or Gardner and Ellsbury, whichever order. Uh, but think about the pressure that Santana would be under if those two got on. And then here comes Aaron Judge with an early chance to really make it an uphill battle for the Twins. Ellsbury has been in the seven or eight holes a lot lately. So Girardi, Girardi could also hit him eight and try to get a lefty-righty, lefty-righty thing going. I just think the possibility of having Judge stride to the plate with two on, none out in the first inning is too good to pass up, at least for me. Keep your eye on New York's starting lineup because it'll be a good indication for us just how aggressive Joe Girardi wants to be in this game. Watch out for New York's bullpen. The finale of that three-game set a couple weeks ago that I mentioned in the history lesson it did not go well for Luis Severino. Uh, it was his second shortest start of the year. He went just three innings, gave up five hits, three earned. He walked one and struck out just three. He threw 71 pitches, probably could have kept going if, if Girardi decided that he wanted to, but I think it was a strategic move because he knew that there was a good chance Severino would be his guy in this game against this Twins team. So why even have the possibility of Severino going back out there and getting rocked around for another inning? Instead, he pulls him and turns the game over to his pen, and Chasen Shreve, Ben Heller, and Domingo Herman combine for six innings, one hit, two walks, seven Ks. The Yankees, as I mentioned, ended up running away with it 11-3. That performance was a microcosm of the entire season for this relief core. Heller and Herman don't even feature because they have so many guys back there, and it really gets no better than Aroldis Chapman, Dellen Batances, David Robertson, Chad Green, Tommy Canely, Shreve, really no better. Uh, so if, if Girardi really wants to, he can pull Severino after three innings again and just give his six shutdown relievers an inning each. The Yankees' pen led the majors in strikeouts per nine at almost 11, 10.91. Home runs per nine at 0.86. 
Batting average on balls in play, 273, and they were third in ERA with a 335 mark. So watch out for New York's bullpen. And again, pay attention to when Girardi, you know, how quick of a hook does he have with his young starter, Luis Severino, who will be making his first postseason start. He's been the horse for the Yankees all year, but you got to wonder how anxious Girardi will be to turn it over to his pen, which has been so good for him all season long. Other news and notes here. The Twins are the first team ever to have a 100 or more lost season one year and make the playoffs in the next. They lost 103 games last year, if you can believe it. They are only the second team ever to have the first overall pick in the summer and then make the playoffs in the fall. That other team was the 08 Rays. Uh, And the other teams in the top five of this year's draft, take a look at them. It's the Reds, the Padres, the Rays, and the Braves. There's no doubt about it. All those teams on the rise, the Rays took a a good step this year winning some games. The Braves have some young, exciting players. The Reds, team that I'm very big on, they need to get some pitching. And the Padres, they're figuring some things out. But there's no doubt that the Twins are obviously – head and shoulders above these other four when it comes to the turnaround that they've been able to make uh, in just one short year. All this really means is that Minnesota's rebuild has taken a huge step forward this season, and really the way they've done it has it's been amazing. Uh, Manager Paul Molitor deserves the bulk of the credit because Miguel Sano was out from August 19 to September 29, And he is, without a doubt, the Minnesota Twins' most potent power option. And when he went out, other guys had to step up, and they did. Since the All-Star break, Brian Dozier, Eddie Rosario, Jorge Polanco, Byron Buxton, even Joe Maurer, they've all been hitting like crazy. Dozier's hit 21 homers in the second half. My guy Eddie Rosario and Jorge Polanco both have more RBI than strikeouts in the second half. Buxton has blossomed into the star that everyone thought he would be, uh, even if he does strike out a ton. He's faster than some lightning I've seen. He makes diving catches all over while covering damn near half the outfield. And now he's starting to hold his own with the bat in his hand, which only helps him make even more of an impact tearing up the base paths. Expect to be impressed by something that Byron Buxton does in this game. Now, what Maurer's done has been cool to watch. He looks like he can actually hit again, even if it's with very limited power. He left the yard just twice in the second half, but still drove in 37 runs. Yankee Stadium, of course, does have that short porch in right field, but don't expect Maurer to be the one that goes over it. Um, I want to get back to Miguel Sano, though, because he is Minnesota's best hitter. Uh, He got an 8 at bat tune up over the weekend just one hit and three strikeouts it's a big bat to get back for the twins but they scored the second most runs in baseball over the past month that tied with the indians and just four runs behind the yankees there is something to be said for the old theory if it ain't broke don't fix it unfortunately at this point sano does not seem to be at his sharpest and Molitor came out today and said he's apparently leaning towards using him off the bench. Of course, we'll have to wait and see what the starting lineup says, but really that might not be such a bad option when you think about just the way that the Twins have been going and having that bat off the bench against that bullpen for the Yankees, which I mentioned, it would be a nice weapon for Molitor to have in his pocket. Now let's make some picks, starting with the home run picks. If you've ever been to a baseball game with me, you know that when you sit down and you look at the lineup, everybody that is in attendance with me has to make a pick. Who is going to hit the first home run of the game? So normally we only do it with the home team or the team that you're there rooting for, but in this case, for the playoff games, I'm going to be picking one guy from each team And in this one, I'm going to go with Eddie Rosario. 25 of his 27 bombs this year came against right-handed pitching. And for the Yankees, while Aaron Judge has been hogging all of the publicity, Gary Sanchez has followed up his incredible second half last year 
with a full season of premier offensive production at the catcher's position. I'm going with both my guys here, hoping they show out Eddie Rosario and Gary Sanchez to hit homers in this game. And the prediction, it's tough. I wanted to take the Twins. They're a great story this year. But I'm going Yankees over the Twins, 6-2. to two. I think the Yankees, they're just too strong um, and, more importantly, deep in the bullpen department. And in this one, I don't think they can be beaten even by the Twins' forceful lineup. Give me the Yankees, 6-2, to two, with home runs from Rosario and Sanchez in that AL wildcard game. Over in the National League, the wildcard matchup is a showdown out west. The Colorado Rockies at the Arizona Diamondbacks. There's a lot of history here as these two teams met 19 times this summer. The D-backs won 11 of those 19, and interestingly, they won at least 11 games against each of their division opponents, including the Los Angeles Dodgers. So that's a big reason why the Diamondbacks find themselves here. The good news for the Rockies is they were able to take 5 of 10 games at Chase Field. The bad news is that their offensive numbers take a huge hit when away from home, and the Diamondbacks get a huge boost when they play in their own barn. Let's take a look at the marquee matchup. It's going to be Zach Greinke versus the heart of the Rockies order, Nolan Arenado, Trevor Story, and Mark Reynolds. The 2017 numbers, Arenado is 6 for 16 with two doubles and a triple against Greinke. And Story and Reynolds are a combined 6 for 29, but four home runs, two apiece. Story struck out four times, Reynolds six. Greinke's climbed the hill against the Rockies five times this year. He's failed to go seven innings just once, and he went six. He struck out 37 batters in 34 and a third innings. He's walked only two. The Colorado Rockies are hitting just 229 against him. And essentially, the D-backs need their ace to go as deep into this game as he can. The bullpen has been good, but they're not very deep. They don't have a lot of arms, a lot of guys to go to. Um, And they lack the proven go-to guys there. And they've really relied on strong starting pitching all season long. They'll surely choose Greinke over any of their relievers in just about every situation. Now, on the other hand, the Rockies, if they're going to get to Greinke... Look like they're going to need it to come from Arenado, Story, or Reynolds. So, to me, this game comes down to these matchups. Can Greinke navigate his way through the meat of this lineup three times and turn it over to the back end of the Snake's pen? And what happens when Story and Reynolds dig in for the third time in the sixth or seventh inning? Arizona is going to stick with their guy until they can't anymore. And every time these three Rockies step to the plate, the chances that they do some major damage go up. So what gives? Well, whichever doesn't likely wins the ballgame. Watch out for J.D. Martinez. Against the Rockies this year, he is 11 for 23 with three homers, nine RBI, 10 runs scored, triple slash of 478, 519, and 1043. It's not often that you get a slugging percentage up above one. JD Martinez has done that against the Rockies this year. Absolutely unreal. 16 homers, 36 RBI in September. That triple slash for the entire month was 396, 431, 950. Like I said, unreal. Real And this wasn't just any month either. It was September where the Diamondbacks were finally able to pull away from the Rockies to earn the right to play this game at home. And J.D. Martinez, simply put, is the biggest reason why. Let's check out some other news and notes. Last year, the Colorado Rockies finished 75-87. and 87. The Arizona Diamondbacks were 69-93. and 93. So props to both for turning it around so quickly, especially in Arizona where they have pretty much an entirely new regime. So that's 12 more wins for the Rocks and 24 more for the D-backs. And that's both commendable and exciting for someone who is growing a bit tired of watching the Giants and Cardinals dominate the NL postseason. 
saw a stat on Twitter today. Somebody said that this is the first Major League Baseball postseason where San Francisco or St. Louis will not be involved. The first one since 2008. That's kind of mind-boggling when you think about just how much success those two franchises have had, but neither of them are around this year, and the Rockies and D-backs are the reason why the Rockies didn't clinch until Saturday. They've been hanging on to a, a quite a sizable lead that they built during a torrid first half. They were 52-39 and 39 at the break. They had a 7.5 game lead over the Cubs and Cards at that time. And basically the second half has just been winning enough games to get here. The D-backs, on the other hand, had their spot in this game sewed up for over... Over a week, they've been waiting, knowing it was likely going to be the Rockies who they'd meet here. But Arizona also had to play the only interleague series to end the season. That's a bit weird. Uh, remember, that's a year-round thing now with 15 teams in each league. Somebody's got to do it. And while it was an advantage to get another guy some at-bats from the DH spot for a weekend, it's still a different thing for them, a break from the usual And if we know one thing about baseball and the guys who play the game, it's very based in routine and guys being on the same schedule, the same everything. Uh, Superstition plays a big part and maybe playing in the American League will have some sort of effect. I don't know. These guys are professionals, but like I said, it is a bit of a different thing for them. Uh, Rocky starter John Gray has faced the D-backs three times this season, twice at Chase Field, and on both of those occasions, he struck out 10 Arizona batters. In 18 innings against the Snakes this year, Gray has given up 19 hits, but only seven runs. So there's been a lot of traffic on the bases around him, but he's been able to strand a lot of those runners. Uh, J.D. Martinez took him deep twice this summer, but Paul Goldschmidt is hitless in nine at-bats, and Jake Lamb has one double in seven at-bats. Silencing those two in this game would be a huge step in the direction of a Colorado victory, and you got to keep your eye on those matchups. The home run picks here, I'm going to go with Trevor Story. Uh, He's one of the few Rockies who's done any sort of damage against Grinke, even if it's been in just a few hits. Um, I'm getting that feeling that Story is going to continue that power hitting success in this game. And J.D. Martinez, duh. I mean, as as for J.D., I've already given you all the stats. I'll also just add that this guy has a flair for the dramatic, and he's established a track record of stepping up when his teams need it most. In 70 plate appearances with two outs and runners in scoring position this year, he's hit a cool 328, 443, 603 with four dingers and 24 driven in. In the postseason, every at-bat feels like it comes with two outs and runners in scoring position in terms of pressure. I don't think J.D. feels that pressure, and I'm willing to bet he comes through here. For a prediction, I'm going to go with the Diamondbacks over the Rockies, 9-8. to eight. I'm calling for a slugfest here with a lot of the damage coming in the latter innings as the game is turned over to a pair of bullpens that have been good but not great this season. Um, yeah, this one's an interesting matchup just because the teams have seen each other so much. Uh, there's really no hiding that can be done. All the scouting has been done throughout the season. Both managers and coaching staff, uh, they know what to look for from the opposition. And at this point, it's just a matter of going out and see who, seeing who is the better team on that night. And for me, it's going to be the Diamondbacks. But really, obviously, by my prediction, 9-8, wouldn't be surprised if the Rockies pulled it out either. So that's going to do it for episode number 21, the Wild Card Round Preview. Gave you the history lesson, uh, the marquee matchup, what to watch for, the home run picks, and predictions for each game. Um, Tuesday at 8 is Twins and Yankees, and then Wednesday at 8 is going to be Rockies, D-backs. If you're watching those games and you need somebody to talk to, follow us on Twitter at Ducks on the Pod, Ducks on the Pod on Facebook as well. I'll try to keep that page posted as the games are going on. Interact with us there. 
Check back in with us later in the week on Thursday. I'm going to have the American League Division Series preview. And then on Friday, the National League Division Series preview. Be on the lookout for those. In the meantime, I'm Mitch Gatsky, thanking you for listening and reminding you of the three keeps of baseball. They are so important. Keep your glove on the dirt, your bat off your shoulder, and always keep your eye on the ball. Back, 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 gone.